Let's give it up for our next TED Like Talk. Condensing seven years of knowledge from the conversational AI space, working with companies like Haptic, HP, um, CDIS, among others, into 20 minutes. Feel free to take pictures. There are lists and checklists everywhere on the screen. Um, and at the end, there's a QR code you can scan. You can reach out if you have any questions. Right. So the way I've structured this is eight questions that I have been asked over the years by designers, product managers, CEOs, companies that want to experiment with conversational AI. And these are common questions, but they have sometimes complicated, nuanced, technical answers. And I've broken all of these down into lists because who doesn't love a good list? So the first question, do I really need conversational AI? And this is a very basic, simple question. But the answer to this it can be found in the fact that 68% of customers today have indicated that they want to reach out to a business messaging through chat. Meta has 3.27 billion daily active people. That's what they say in their uh, earnings report. So there is clearly a large market out there of customers who want to talk to brands and businesses personally have a personalized conversation. You've heard many of the speakers say this, right? So clearly there's a, there's a, customer, there's a customer base out there. But is this right for your business? So the way I divide this is into five steps, five mini questions you can ask. First one is, have my customers indicated that they need this? Have you been having people reaching out to you on different channels, maybe asking repeated common questions? Um, the idea is not to implement AI for the sake of AI, which is a common thing you'll see a lot of companies come in and do. They'll say, hey, AI is cool, let's implement it. Please don't do that. Don't try to copy and replicate what's on your website and put it inside your chatbot or conversational AI solution because a conversational solution is there to help what's there on an existing platform. If you have a chatbot on a website, don't copy the website and put it in there. It's supposed to maybe do something extra for the customer, maybe support with customization questions as opposed to repeatedly answering the same questions to the website. And start small. This is something a lot of companies also I've seen uh, fail at, they intend to start super big on day one, and it's not necessary, and we'll talk about this in one of the upcoming slides. Second, which stage are you targeting? There are three stages. You can learn more about it, look up your marketing funnel. There's pre-purchase, purchase, post-purchase. Post Don't try to get into the rut of trying to do all three at once immediately. Divide and conquer, always. There's just going to be different problems on different stages. And then what do you want to measure? Talk to your leadership about this um, on day one. This metric. If you establish on day one, it's going to save you a lot of pain when it comes to launching because you're not going to be confused about what number you want to measure. Is it acquisition? Are you trying to get more customers? Are you trying to retain existing customers? Are you trying to increase the customer lifetime value? All of these are questions that you should be asking again on day one if you're a product designer or product owner who's been assigned to a conversational AI solution. And then finally, uh, are you technically ready? Many companies fall into the trap of saying, we want a cutting edge, LLM based AI solution that's hosted on-prem. No data should go outside without having a single uh, bit of the technical infrastructure ready for this. Who is going to develop this? Who is going to maintain the data? Do you have the necessary infrastructure to store this properly and be able to fetch the data? So select the right problem. The next one, three simple questions. Uh, how, how, do you get, how do you decide whether a problem is the correct problem? Number one, is this an automatable problem? If you have a lot of customers as an insurance company, say they reach out for claims, and maybe it's a sensitive situation where a loved one has passed away, and it requires a little bit of back and forth, and a human agent is required for those kind of conversations, please don't try to automate it. Maybe they need to talk to a person, have a heart-to-heart, -heart, and then get into, the pro get into the solution of it. So be very mindful of who your um, customers are at the end of the day. Try to only automate when it is a solution that has a straightforward answer. Second one, is this a repeatable time, kind of time consuming task which is high effort but low creativity? Excellent chance, excellent opportunity for automation. And then finally, is it very easy to measure the results of this? I'll keep talking about measurement because this is something most teams skip. Right? So now we've chosen a problem, we probably have a problem, uh, a clear idea that yes, conversationally is the right thing for me. Second most common misunderstood 
thing is, is, is chat GPT equal to chatbots and conversational AI? If I have LLMs, is it conversational AI? Not necessary. Three layers to this as well. First one is your scripted and your rule-based bots. These are, think of your IVR, hi, click one to get an answer, click two to get, get an answer. The answers are very basic, usually uh, simple FAQs, and there's barely any integrations. Great when you're trying to just deflect from one channel to other. Someone calls you on IVR, you want to push them to chat to have a deeper conversation, go for something like this. Second, keyword-based bots. This is where the world was, you know, last year before the advent of uh, uh, the LLMs, and unless you had access to a proprietary AI uh, uh, system and setup, lots of keyword-based bots out there. Simple questions, simple answer, basic CRM integrations. There wasn't much context retention, so halfway through a conversation, if you said, hey, I'm talking about the previous uh, product that you were showing me, probably wouldn't work. Wouldn't have be able to handle customers who went a little bit off the beaten path, off the scripts that you have prepared. Any ambiguity, um, maybe English or customers stepping in with un unexpected questions would not be handled. But these are good when you want a clear, structured uh, approach and very, very predictable answers um, for, for this. Uh, and you want to resolve simple questions. Third one is your cognitive intelligent assistants. This, these are the assistants that can handle people switching conversations halfway. Hi, I want to know about a product. Uh, okay, uh, but you know what, uh, can you also tell me about uh, the ticket that I raised that day? Being able to handle this type of context retention, context switching is possible using a very intelligent AI layer. Is it bad if I want to only go for layer two? Not really. If you're a small business that wants to solve a simple problem, you don't need to go to the cost and extra layer, uh, extra step of designing and going for a cognitive intelligence assistant. I always recommend a combination of second of the second layer and the third layer to solve practical problems for most companies. And then, third question, again very common: Do I need a bleeding edge platform to build a really good bot? Very simple answer: It depends, but not really. There's five decisions, and this is often where I've seen product designers mix up these steps. So the first one is your platform. If you're a simple business, simple problems, simple solutions, don't have a big team, and you're interested in just dabbling in AI, go for a simple, usable, drag and drop, low code, no code type of platform. You don't need something which has big integrations, legacy system integrations, you don't need that. Experimenting with a bot, you can go live within a couple of days to a week, really, if you really want to go for a no code solution. Second point. Language. Two types here. You have uh, multilingual, which is English, uh, Spanish, Hindi, single languages, or you, have, you do a combination of two or three languages. Key thing to remember here, make sure that you tell your customers that these languages are available and that they're discoverable within the bot. I'm not going to talk about how to make it more discoverable, or if you're product designers and product owners, you already know how to do that. But that's the first part. Second one is your macaronic language support, which is hybrid. English, uh, combination of two languages. Uh, we all know that in India, most people, that's how we chat. We chat with a combination of multiple languages. But this support, don't assume that if you build for both English and Hindi, English is assumed to be a part of the stack. It's not. You have to build it as a separate supported language and make sure that you have responses coded for those. Third one is the mode. Mode is text, voice. Think of your um, Alexa, which has a uh, display on it, would be text plus voice. Uh, and or it could be multimodal. Maybe you have a kiosk where you can even do gestures. That would be text plus voice plus gesture. That's your third uh, decision to take. Fourth decision, are you going to go live on single channels, like maybe uh, just WhatsApp or Facebook? Um, or are you going to go live on multiple channels? Key thing to remember here is that uh, if you go live with a, con a combination of uh, multiple channels, are you going to build the same experience for all? Or do you want to do individualized separate experiences for all of them? It really depends on the platform that you select. So if you select a platform that lets you build a customized experience per, plat or per channel, that's usually great because you don't end up building for the lowest common denominator, which is a text experience for all of them. Okay? And then the fifth one is your integrations. There are three types of integrations that you should be thinking about. First one is your database. CRM APIs to put data into a chatbot and fetch data. Second one is how to push a person outside a chatbot, like agent handovers if they're no longer interested in talking to you. And the third one, third type of integration is your analytics. 
how are you going to track customer success? Are you able to track every part of the funnel when they come in, when they uh, drop off, when they say something negative? How are you able to track it? So these are the top five decisions. Now, how long does it take? I'm going to show you all the steps of the process because this is very similar to a typical product development process. If you've done the problem selection correctly, the brief stage probably can jump through very quickly. It's like good PRD makes a good product, brief stage, all done. Design is when you decide whether, and this is conversation design, so I could go on and on about it. But in design, this is where you decide whether you solve a problem in one sentence or in five steps. I can answer the question, where is my order, in one line, saying, hey, your order is going to take 21 days. Or I could go fetch, fetch an order number from the, from the database, show it to the customer, tell them to select an order, make it a full three or four step journey. That decision is taken in step two by your conversation designer or UX designer. Third one is develop. Design and development can be combined sometimes if you have a good powerful platform that lets you do iterative development really quickly. But I don't recommend skipping design at all. I, would, I know everyone in this room will agree with me on that, but companies are trying to optimize this more and more. Fifth, uh, the fourth stage is test. This is where you get your uh, you know, QA team to test it and finally go live. Not going to go too deep into that. Overall, how long does this take? To make a quick demo bot, it's as easy as doing it in a few hours now with any platform. But for a truly thought through solution that has, that's enterprise grade, the time is four weeks, typically to six months. Seen it done shorter, seen it done quicker, all quite possible. But this is the typical range that you would see for a solution like this. Now, what goes into chatbot design? Let's say you've been tasked as a product owner, like, hey, let's add a LLM based chat solution into our product stack. I'm going to just call out around six elements that you should keep in mind. There's so much we can talk about each step. But very quickly, quick checklist to make sure you absolutely do this bare minimum in your platform, right? Number one, how are you be bringing people in? Do you have notifications? Do they click on an ad and come to the chatbot? How do they come into the bot? That's the first thing you should think about. And if you don't do this right, you're going to end up with extremely low traffic bots with no usage. That's what ends up killing a lot of chatbot projects these days. How do you drive traffic into the bot? Second, how are you using the, the UI that's available to you to make sure that the journey is interesting? Often with a lot of LLM-based bots, you'll see this. You ask a question, there's a giant paragraph of an answer. How is that interesting? It's so boring to read, right? If it's a WhatsApp bot, if it's a web bot especially, you could do cards, you could, it's, it's so basic. Do images, do charts, you get so many things to do. Do a vertical card list. But make sure you utilize whatever channel-specific UI is there. Next, there should be a customizable feedback layer, which is connected to your analytics. Make sure you collect feedback and collect feedback in chat. So an from an experiment we've done, all of these modals that pop up usually on chat take away from the chat experience. Massive drop-off, don't do that. Try to collect conversational analytics feedback as much as possible. Fourth, make sure that you have a way for a customer to exit if, it, if there's no exit door in a conference hall, how frustrating would that be? When a customer is screaming at you that they want to talk to an agent, please let them go. Let them go and move to another channel if needed. Fifth, handle error messages very well. Don't send error messages like, please come back later. This is a conversation. You would never tell a person to halfway leave the room and then come back at an undefined time. Please, please tell them exactly when to come back. Give them a button. Give well-defined answers. And one of the earlier speakers has mentioned a content checklist, right? So use, use better defined messages to give a, a customer a way to come back whenever there are errors. Last, make sure that you define your intents extremely clearly on your NLU layer. Designers need to know this. Learn about mutual funds and buy mutual funds are two different intents. How? Learn about mutual funds indicates that the customer is early stage, doesn't know much, probably give them more educational content. Buy mutual funds means that they're ready to purchase, they know what they want and they want to buy things. So these types of nuances in conversation, understanding the intent of the customer and sending them to the right journey is also to be thought about at a design stage, otherwise you'll never end up designing for those. Right? So these are six things, key checklist of element design. I'm going to run very quickly through the last three questions. I've built my bot, now what? Most people forget about this because we're so busy <laughs> creating a big project that we don't know, we don't plan what to do next, right? Five, four things, I think. Uh, number one, don't look at only the chatbot data. The, uh, most product teams, they look at the chatbot efficiency rates. 
hey, 80 percent automation, we should be very happy with this. That's not true. If your agent numbers have risen high while your bot numbers are also high, clearly there is something wrong. So look at both sources together as a source of truth and then say whether your chatbot has been uh, successful or, uh, or not. Next, don't just do things because uh, leadership has suddenly tested a chatbot or your conversational solution and said, hey, this is bad. That's not the way to take a business decision. I know all of us fell prey to it. That's not how you do it. Make sure that you combine, if it's, if it's easy and uh, quick to solve a problem, if the time to value is lower, go ahead, pick that. Solve it for business impact. Third, make sure that in your platform, very practical piece of advice, switch on all of the, all of the settings that let you collect data to help you improve your chatbot later on. We've had cases where uh, teams completely forgotten to switch on the data collection tag and don't know how to improve a bot. Don't do that. And don't be, uh, do, uh, you know, don't get panicked if your numbers start fluctuating the day you launch. That usually happens when suddenly you have a big influx of queries because the chatbot has launched. That does not mean your bot is bad. It's usually because there is something that has changed in the customer experience. You can always compare pre and post to make sure that there's a good change going on. All right, second last question, and I have four more minutes. So should I trust Gen AI chatbots at all? Can I trust this at all? Uh, I'm going to call out some issues. The answer to yes, should Gen AI be trusted is yes. But these are the issues that we've seen, uh, at least in the conversational AI space. Number one, LLMs are great at answering general questions. Generic answer, general question, great. But the moment you get granular with a question, let's say you're building a bot for a university, and you ask about fees for a specific course, and you've trained it with this large corpus of data, making sure that the data, correct data is pulled from the database when it's given this big dump of PDFs, that accuracy of outputs can go crazy. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to control, and that's one key thing you should focus on. Next thing here, um, maintaining consistent tone and branding throughout. Making sure that if your personality if, is that of, uh, let's say, Barbie at the st uh, start of the conversation, you don't want it to devolve into something sarcastic and crazy towards the end of it. You make sure that your LLM-based bots maintain that persona throughout. And then the third one is uh, with open GPT playgrounds. If your LLM-based bot is suddenly said, hey, is this competitor's product, product good? Make sure that your bot suddenly doesn't start saying, you know what, that competitor is great as well. Because it's, again, trained, like I said, on usually a generic corpus of data. These are the kinds of mistakes that we've seen when, uh, you know, when jailbreak is possible with an open, open playground. Fourth, very important ethical consideration. And you'll hear, I think, more about this from more speakers, is how, what kind of data are you using to train your bot? Is your customer aware of it? And who owns this data? When you're talking about an enterprise customer, you really need to be sensitive about who you're passing this con data on to. Right? And then, can't Gen AI chatbots just do everything? Well, not really. Just because you have an LLM does not mean you have a chatbot. Just because you have chat GPT does not mean you have a conversational AI solution. It can do a few things. Number one, it can support you with uh, taking in a large quantity of data like your website, CRM, PDF data, convert that into a readable format, and have your bot answer general questions from it very well. And can do that pretty well, actually. It can handle slightly more complex intents and can also retain context. Uh, I've seen a few companies do this really well, where uh, in, this is for a shopping context, where you show a series of many products and you ask the bot, hey, I'm talking about the first product. Can you go back and show me the red shirt? Does a very good job of being able to handle these intents and retain that context. It can also save you a lot of transformation time. All the time that was spent by us designers, probably weeks actually, uh, rewriting FAQs. 300 FAQs have to be rewritten in the exact tone and personality for a chatbot. It would take a week, like weeks of time uh, to exactly maintain it. But LLMs do a great job of doing this transformation activity for us. So definitely, feel free, go ahead and use it. And the last one is creating training data. To help train chatbots, uh, there's a lot of utterances and intents required. Very easily automated uh, using Gen AI. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I know it is very, very intense with many lists. But uh, yeah.